the workshop tonight on medicated this is going to go through we're going to go through some protocols on how to get off of the different medications the different big lifestyle uh, medications thyroid uh, acid reflux blood pressure cholesterol all these different medications and what I want you to pay attention to is as we go through protocol after protocol after protocol see if you guys notice some patterns okay and uh, and at the end you'll 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 probably be able to figure out what's actually going on here okay so uh, this this opening picture I want to start with this just to uh, just to show you you know where 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 all this is coming from and and you know what what stands behind the scenes with medicine this uh, in this picture this is actually a quite famous picture it's one of the few that you can actually find of a uh, a lobotomy being done okay does everybody know what a lobotomy is okay where they they used to uh, take an ice pick and go up through your orbit in the back of your eye so they would lift your lift your eyelid and this was voluntary basis okay so people that had mental issues would voluntarily let them take an ice pick and and use a hammer to tap it through their orbit into their brain and then scramble their brain you guys have heard of this before right? they would scramble the frontal lobe because of course when you scramble the frontal lobe what would occur is you would lose your emotional center of the brain okay it was uh, of course it only lasted so long because patients would routinely die from uh, from internal bleeding um, but there was actually a famous doctor I don't know if this is him or not um, but there was a famous doctor uh, who made his rounds in the lobotomobile it was it, it was this this was no joke this was like his marketing forte was the lobotomobile and he would travel from city to city into different locations and people would line up to come and step inside of his van and get a lobotomy done so this this was understood as routine right this was what worked this is how you cure depression this is how you cure anxiety this is how you cure bipolar disorder schizophrenia right this was the method all right so so pretty shocking right pretty appalling that this actually happened all right now this workshop in no way is designed to offer personal medical advice. It is educational in nature. If you choose to proceed with any protocol contained here within, you should consult a medical physician, and I'm certain they will respect your personal decision and provide you additional guidance. Did you guys get that disclaimer? Okay. All right, let's move on. So you think vitamin protocols are expensive. Um, just before we go into this, uh, because I understand a lot of this stuff is nutritional based. You, you have to go through the nutritional protocols to be able to deal with this stuff. Diabetes is $1,700 a year for men and up to $2,100 a year for women to maintain diabetes treatment. That means medications, insulin, all that kind of stuff. So if you end up with diabetes, that's going to be the cost on an annual basis. A minor heart attack, according to CBS News, whether insurance covers it or not, that's kind of a, you know, whether you pay for it on the front end or you pay for it through high deductibles and high premiums later, you're going to pay for it eventually. That's the idea with insurance because they are a for-profit company. If you don't pay for it, everybody around you does. So this is why health insurance is so expensive because when somebody we know has a heart attack, we all get to chip in. Okay. So it doesn't matter how their lifestyle was or any of these other factors. It's still, the fact of the matter is it costs about $760,000 for just a minor heart attack. It's well over a million dollars if it's a, a major heart attack followed by surgeries and all this other stuff. Okay? Uh, cancer, depending on the type of cancer that you, uh, that I'll, I'll poke fun and get, you don't get cancer, okay? You develop cancer, but if you develop cancer, it's anywhere from $5,000 to $37,000 out of pocket in the first year. Okay, so these are the costs of disease. These are the costs that are associated with not doing the proper things to take care of yourself and eliminate them while we have the opportunity. Okay, so these are, uh, this, uh, this is a little bit of the questionable medical history. Uh, medical blunders of the past. Everybody's heard of bloodletting. Okay, 
you, you've, I'm sure, heard that uh, George Washington died from bloodletting, our first president. No? Well, that's actually not true. He did get bloodletting done um, for he had a, a cold or you know a fever or something like that, so they did bloodletting, uh, but it was actually the mercury that killed him. They gave him a spoonful of mercury, and that's what did him off. So if draining half of your blood doesn't kill you, we're going to finish you off with a spoonful of mercury, which you guys know don't touch, right? But that was a cure of the past. This was standard, you know, ordinary treatment. Leeches was an ordinary treatment. Great way to pass microbes and, uh, and infection. Uh, ice pick lobotomy, we already covered that one. Um, that, that was for mental disorders. Shock therapy. That, you know, they still do shock therapy today. It's just not as aggressive, right? We, we don't, you know, you don't uh, completely fry the brain. You just do it with mild electrical currents. Okay? Now, now, they've, uh, now they've gotten humane. They'll put you under first so that they don't have to have four people hold down your arms and legs as you're writhing on the table, right? Uh, hemiglozectomy. They would actually cut off half of your tongue. I don't even remember what, what the treatment, what that uh, was supposed to be treating. Maybe overeating disorder, right? Um, but uh, they, would, they would cut off half of your tongue. Nasopharyngeal radium irrad irradiation. They would, uh, for nasal issues, they would put radioactive radium up your nose and hold it there for a period of time then, and then withdraw it back out. And so the radiation damage from that would be ongoing. So, of course, they stopped that because that was dumb. Uh, heroin, that was, a, that was a medication. Heroin, it's illegal now. You can buy all the other medications that are totally legal that have a lot of the same effects, but you can't use heroin anymore because that would be awful, right? Uh, arsenic, which is known as a very potent poison that you can, you know, people use to poison their spouses with and stuff nowadays, but that was a treatment <laughs> back then. That was an actual treatment. Uh, and then tobacco enema. I mean, we still do enemas today. I mean, and you know, I I kind of I don't I don't think they're necessarily a bad idea if you've got a, a big pendulous abdomen. But uh, I don't know about using tobacco for it. Um, coffee tends to work better. But these are these are just some of the the medical blunders of the past of just things that were standard, ordinary treatment that were done over and over and over and over again. They were widely accepted, and and we thought that they were good ideas. Okay, here are some of the, uh, the current medical blunders of today. Cytotoxic chemotherapy. See, that, that might sound shocking to you. If you guys haven't been around, I mean, if you've been around here for a while, that's not shocking to you. But, but you, you know, anybody hearing that for the first time, they'd be like, what? What are you talking about? That's like the top echelon of medical science, right, is chemotherapy. Um, but the research tells you the absolute opposite. There was a study in Australia that came out that showed in the United States it's 2.3% effective at reducing your risk of cancer. Or, at, or, I'm sorry, not reducing your risk, at improving your outcome with cancer. 2.3%. Actual cumulative. They mask the numbers by showing, uh, for example, one of the uh, tamoxifen. Uh, because they expect X number of women to actually get cancer within the time period that they do the testing and because one of those two women ended up not getting cancer or not having it return they claim a 50 percent uh, reduction of risk <clears throat> even though out of a hundred it was really only one person that didn't get cancer who they thought should because of their numbers but because one out of two, hey, that's a 50% improvement. So now it's standard treatment, tamoxifen after breast cancer. For a 1% actual cumulative change. So you see how science is manipulated. So one, trust me, sometime down the road, we're going to look back at chemotherapy and say, that was dumb. You know, putting, filling people full of bags of lead, that was dumb. You know, when you have to call something the red devil, not a good idea. Pumping people full of chemicals that will chew through this floor, not a good idea. Right? Uh, psychotropic medications. They're, they're basically the same thing as a, as a lobotomy. They're a chemical 
lobotomy. See, an ice pick was awful. An ice pick was invasive. An ice pick made you uh, lose your mind. Well, what does what does a drug do? The drugs work exactly the same way. They shut down the frontal cortex. So, you know, we we we've, we've got to look at it and say it's literally the same thing. And and you know, the ice pick that's irreparable, right? I mean, you bleed all over the place. Well, these medications do irreparable damage also. So we got to look at these things as literally the same things. We're just doing it a different, more sane, or more uh, socially acceptable method of doing it. But it's the same stuff. Uh, it, you go into a mental institution and look at the patients there. Right? You know, they're, they, they didn't get ice pick lobotomies, but they're on so many medications <laughs> that they're not human anymore. I mean, they're, they're just, they're, they're vegetables. They're walking, talking vegetables, some talking. Uh, hysterectomy. This is like, you know, the thing going, going, you know, if it's not working, if it's not working right, rip it out. Right? Well, you, you can live without it. Well, you can live without an arm too. Right? Would everybody agree? But if you had a problem with your finger and it wasn't, you know, and it was, or, you know, would, would you just go and lop your arm off? You know, you have a shoulder issue, you're just going to cut that arm off. I mean, you're not going to have any shoulder problems anymore. Would you agree? <laughs> if you don't have it anymore, you can't have problems with it anymore. So that's the method that's happening here. Just, you know, you have problems, we can't figure out what's going on, so we're just going to remove it all together, and then you won't have a problem anymore. I mean, you don't plan on having any more babies, right? And we think that's all it's used for. <laughs> Preventive mastectomy. That one's just now starting to kind of take a, a new interest, thanks to Angelina Jolie. You know that uh, you should just go in, because a gene test shows you that you have a dominant, you know, the, this, uh, this cautionary gene, that you should just go and lop your, uh, lop your breasts off. Okay? And then get fake ones. And then get, and then get fake ones, yeah. That's what they're doing. So... I don't know about you, but I, uh, I hope they don't find a, a gene for testicular cancer. <laughs> uh, radiation therapy. You know, radiation therapy is kind of the same thing. Sorry. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's taking... We know radiation is dangerous. I mean, people even have problems with x-rays. But you look at the research, you, you look at what a... Mas or not a mastectomy, a... Um, uh, mammogram does. You know, the amount of radiation in, in a mammogram. Can you grab one of those radiation sheets, by the way? And I'll give you the actual numbers on that. Uh, you know, when we go through and we're talking about taking x-rays on people, you know, people are concerned about getting x-rays. Rightfully so. I mean, I'm concerned about it too. I always make sure that people know, you know, we take, we, we went the extra expense that we didn't need to to get the digital system just to cut down on your radiation. Uh, because I don't want to get to the end of my lifetime Realizing that, you know, I irradiated a bunch of kids unnecessarily, you know, with excessive amounts. So we're going to do what we need to do to cut that down, not just for my family, but yours. Um, a, uh, let's see, a mammogram? Over just, uh, a mammogram's equivalent is 300 chest x-rays all at once. So imagine, yeah, oh my gosh. So imagine you, you know, you're pancaked in this thing. And, and I'm sitting in front of my machine hitting the button 300 times. That's the same amount of radiation you're getting in a very confined space. So now, what do we know in the research? Mammograms cause cancer. And there's a 40% false positive rate. 40% false positive rate. So you get treatment even though you don't have it. Uh, a CT scan? Who in here has had a CT scan? You ready for this? A thousand chest x-rays in one shot. And yet they're doing these. The, the, the thing that kills me, uh, you guys can pass this around if you wanna, if you wanna read that. And I mean, we've got more of them if you wanna, if you wanna read, take one with you. Um, the thing that kills me is that MRIs have kind of gone to the wayside for the most part and CTs are like the standard operational measure now like that's what everybody's using and it's all about profits but it's like I'd rather have an MRI than a CT 
because the MRI at least, you know, just makes everything go in one direction, you know, magnetically. It's not massive amounts of radiation. But the moral of the story is you'll get, you know, I always tell patients, you get less x-ray exposure in a lifetime in my office than you do in one single CT scan. I mean, that's shocking when you think about it. So radiation therapy, though, totally different ballgame. Totally different ballgame. When you sit inside of a <clears throat> CT machine, they don't, you don't come out of it and get told, I'm sorry, we charred your tissue. Think about that. Who do you know that's ever gotten charred in a CT machine? Yet, that's what standard happens with radiation therapy is, is patients come and they say, well, they burned my insides. They actually tell me they burned it because they, they use too much. I mean, that's just, it, it's unbelievable. Vaccination. Um, I'm not going to beat that one down. You guys can uh, you guys can go and watch the uh, the workshop that we did what a couple months back, raising healthy kids from conception. If you don't know the picture behind that, you need to go and uh, watch that workshop. Same thing, pariah circumcision. That's the way that circumcisions are are done nowadays. Um, it is not a biblical circumcision, and it's it's uh, not. I, I mean, it's it's just appalling when you when you think about how it's done. Um, and, and you, you see the way things are, were supposed to be done from a biblical perspective and there's just no, there's no benefits to it. There's no scientific evidence behind it, yet we continue to do it. So, you know, that rate is dropping. I go through all that information in that workshop as well. Uh, childhood ADHD medications, we're going to kind of touch on that today, but that's like, I mean, that's getting to a whole different level now. I mean, we are, we are massively poisoning an entire, an entire generation. I mean, a one, something like one in six kids now, or one in eight, I mean, it's just this unbelievable amount of kids are on these drugs. And we are messing with brain chemistry as the brain is developing. That's insane. So, you know, but it's because parents just don't know. You know, it's not, it's, it's like my parents, you know, I got 11 years of allergy shots and a handful of pills every day, but my parents didn't know, you know, so, and I, I can't say I'm upset about it because I ended up becoming a chiropractor because of it. So, you guys benefit from my demise. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this here, I, I wanted to show you this. This is the, uh, this is the actual um, uh, Greek uh, and this is Revelation 21, what is it, Revelation 21, 1823, Revelation 1823, I can't believe I didn't put that on there. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Sorcery is a really interesting choice of translation here. Okay? Because when you look at the actual word, the word is pharmakia, and it's very clear this is the actual, this is from the lexicon. You guys can look this up. It's on uh, blueletterbible.org. It's just a Bible tool software that everybody has access to, that you can look at the original text, and you can look at the actual words and what they mean from their original context. And uh, the number one, choice A, is the use or the administering of drugs. And B is poisoning. Now where the heck do we get sorcery from that? Interesting, isn't it? You know, there's it has nothing to do with sorcery, but that's the word that was chosen to be translated into. So I think it's pretty clear when you read that again that that's, that's what we're walking towards and what we could argue we're experiencing right now. That all the nations are being deceived by uh, the use of the administering of medications as God. You know, that basically the medications are salvation and are going to fix all of your problems. So don't worry about, you know, don't worry about going to God for it. Here's a pill. You know, that's a sign of the times. So I go through all this because I want to point something out. I get this question all the time that, um, you know, why don't chiropractors and medical doctors work together? And, you know, it depends on the day that you catch me as to what the answer is going to be. I don't, I don't really, you know, I don't really, I don't hate doctors. I don't, I don't blame the person. 
Okay, I blame the system. I blame the way that they're educated. I blame that <laughs> the fact that they're lied to just as much as everybody else is, but to a whole different level. I mean, they're lied to so much that they become the liars, and they don't even realize it. But chiropractic, here's the reality. Chiropractic and medicine can never reconcile. We can never reconcile. Uh, their core philosophies are diametrically and completely opposed. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. Medicine operates outside in, right? Everything that is done is outside in. It's all about treatment to the individual, right? Okay, so when you think about that, you sit down and you ponder this, what it leads you to is the unavoidable conclusion that what is outside is greater than that which is inside. In other words, you're broken, you're messed up, and so we are outside influences greater than what is inside of you, so therefore we need to fix you. You know, you're, think about it, you're genetically incomplete. You know, you're genetically messed up. You've got organs in there that don't need to be there anymore, that you don't need. They're unnecessary. So you are faultly made. You know, I've, all, these are the ideas that are promoted. You see them everywhere, okay? You see them all over the place when you look at the way that treatments are done and the way that the philosophy works. So what is outside is greater than that which is inside. Well, chiropractic operates on the opposite end of the scale. It operates above, down, inside out, okay? So that leads you to the unavoidable conclusion that what is inside is greater than that which is outside. In other words, if I want to be healthy, it's going to come from the inside. If I'm going to heal, it comes from the inside. It doesn't come from the outside. All I can do from the outside is remove interference. I'll, all I need to do is support the body, and your body is going to heal itself. So do you see how those two conclusions are going to clash heads together, and they can't reconcile? Okay, so, you know, I, I, this is just really important because it, it governs the way that you see why chiropractors do things this way and medical doctors do things this way. They, they just don't, they're never going to come together in the middle. Okay? Um, well, they will come together in the middle in one circumstance when parts are removed. Because if a part is removed, I'll agree I can't fix that part anymore. Make sense? Okay, so ADHD, antidepressants, and psychotropics. The fact that these medications work is not in question at all. It's not in question. The question is as to their safety and legitimacy. Like I, you know, and the reason why I say that is because I have patients all the time who come in on their first visit, I find out that they're taking medications. And when I ask them about the medications, they'll say, well, I have to take that medication or no, it really helps. You know, like, like essentially that I'm challenging that the medication works. And you see, I'm not at all challenging that the medication works. And here's why. If you were hostile, we could certainly drug you into a harmless vegetable. End of story, right? We cannot argue that the medications work. They do work. So that's not the question. The question is as to their safety and legitimacy, and, and really to their necessity. Do you really need to be drugged into a vegetable? That's the question. And I would argue... No, because that which is inside is greater than that which is outside. You know, we need to get things working better on the inside. Uh, so, in other words, fix the real problems. You know, somehow get to the bottom of the real problems and help, help that overcome. Uh, there, and, and, and in case you're wondering on that note, you know, the, the, the medical side would say, well, it's, you can't do that because it's caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. And that is a theory that has never been true. It has never been proven true. It was, uh, uh, Ant, Ant, uh, what was the doctor's name? Um, I think Ansel Keys comes to mind. Uh, but don't quote me on that. But you can find out. I mean, you could, you could look this up. And uh, it's, it's basically the theory of, of uh, chemical imbalance causing mental issues. It was just some guy's theory like he proposed it in a medical journal that it might be caused by chemical imbalance. And everybody was like, take up the flag, you know, and they said, that sounds good. And they just ran with it. But it's never been proven true. And to this day, they still promote it that way, but it's never been proven true. Okay? There's a problem with that. 
So ADHD meds have been based on cocaine and, meth and methamphetamine. This is, this is where these drugs come from. They come from heavy narcotics. Okay? So uh, antidepressants work essentially as a chemical lobotomy. They, they work by stunting brain chemistry. They turn it off like a switch. They just go in there and they, they just pop your bubble, right? They just shut things down. This process essentially removes humanity by, by eliminating emotional response. If you think about it, that is what makes us human, is emotional response and emotional reactivity. I mean, if you have a lion that's about to attack a gazelle, it's not contemplating its emotions. You know, it's, it's, it's operating on instinct. So what happens when humans operate merely on instinct? Oh, you looked at me. You know, <laughs> you 18 year old kid, right? You know, it's just uh, uh, you looked at me. I'm going to beat your face in now, right? That's that's what happens when you work on instinct. Emotions is the ability to gauge that and say and come to a different conclusion. Make sense? So that it, these medications literally work by by removing humanity. I mean, they just there there's no other way to look at it. Okay, so. Here's a protocol on, on what to do about this. Uh, first alert, these medications may have already permanently altered your brain's ability to operate in neurotransmitter homeostasis. And I'm going to be using some big words here because there's just no way to get these thoughts out in, in a short format without using big words. So if you guys don't know what something means, just raise your hand or just say, what does that mean? Okay, because I'm sure multiple people don't know what that means. So neurotransmitter homeostasis is basically the neurotransmitters are the chemicals that run your brain. And homeostasis is when all those chemicals are working in proper sync with each other. They're working, they all have the same amounts and they're working in regulating themselves. <laughs> so how do these medications work? They work by shutting down neurochemicals. Neurochemist, neurotransmitters are shut off. So how can they work in proper harmony when one has a wet sock thrown on top of it, right? So these medications may have already permanently altered your brain's ability to operate in that homeostasis. So at that point, it's going to be a, you know, you've got to understand that there, there's a possibility that things will never be exactly the same, okay? Or you'll never really be able to cope completely. So that, however, does not mean that you should stay on them emitting further damage, though. Does that make sense? It's like, if we know that's how the drugs work by shutting it down, how is staying on the drugs and continuing to shut them down going to continue to fix the problem? It just makes the problem worse the longer that you're on them. If you guys know anybody that's taken eight different psychotropic medications, anybody in here know somebody like that? You, you know, if, if, if you know somebody like that, you see exactly what I mean. It's, it's a downhill fight. Um, most people start off on one and they're like, well, I'm just using it for this. But they don't realize the longer they're on them, the more the problem amplifies and it just continues to creep up bigger and bigger. And so, you know, one day you find yourself on five different medications. One for depression, one for anxiety, one for sleeping, one for waking up, one for, you know, uh, it's just, it's all over the place. So slow systemic removal normally works best in two to four week splits. That's what we find is that when you, when you go, uh, when you take what you're, when you're on what you're taking and you split it in half and you do that for two to four weeks and then you split it in half again, two to four weeks, half again, two to four weeks and then off. You know, something along that lines so that you're slowly working it out of your system. You don't want to just cut it off just like that because you're messing with brain chemistry. Okay. This is, I mean, I've had, I, we of course have patients that they'll come in there and they'll tell me, you know, I, I got off my medication three weeks ago and I said, how'd you do that? And they said, oh, I just stopped taking it. And I'm like, so how'd that go? I've been bawling like crazy. You know, it's like, that, that's what we see. I mean, there's uncontrollable crying and emotions and everything else. So uh, when you work it slow, it works better. Uh, testing. None is necessary as no test can prove these conditions exist in the first place. Okay. All these questionnaires and all this other stuff. I mean, if I'm feeling depressed and somebody asks me, do I feel depressed? The answer is going to be yes. But how is that a medical basis for proving depression? Right? 
You know, if, if a school teacher gives your kid a, an exam that says, do you have problems concentrating in class? And he says, heck yeah. So how can that prove that you have ADHD? It doesn't. It proves you like to play video games and you think about them a lot, right? That's all it proves. But we're using these things, these questionnaires, to prove diseases that don't exist medically, scientifically. From a scientific standpoint, unless you can prove it on paper, there's some biological or chemical marker, it's not there. This is, I mean, doctors have no problem saying that you don't have fibromyalgia or you don't have some of these other issues because they can't prove it, yet they'll turn around and readily document that you've got depression. It doesn't make any sense. They dis, they, they'll tell you, how many doctors out there will tell you still today, subluxation does not exist. Even though we can see it on x-rays, I mean, we can prove it's there, yet they'll still claim it doesn't exist, yet they expect us to believe that depression can be proven. What gives, right? It's, you know, so this is just scientific approach. So support, this is how you support, um, th this is how I'd go through the process. Core supplements, um, if you guys don't have the list of the core supplements, ask for it. These are basic things, vitamin D, um, vitamin D is an activator of the immune system. It's a hormone. It's an essential hormone that's produced when you're in the sun. Uh, omega fatty acids. They make up the cell membrane of every cell in your body, including the neurons, including uh, the, the nucleotide membranes, uh, or the, uh, the mitochondria membranes, the nucleus membrane. Um, all these membranes are made of essential fatty acids. So they're going to work. Uh, iodine. Is big with the thyroid, which is a hormonal pathway. It's a hormonal guardian, so it's it's working with everything else in the body. If you're deficient in iodine, that's going to mess it up. Uh, so the core supplements really cover all the different bases of the the the, the big nutritional deficiencies that are discussed in the deficiency workshop. If you guys didn't get that, that's on the YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash Dr. Bucknell two. So D R B U C K N E L L two. And it's all on there. Um, number two, the aggressive diet protocol to minimize effects of transition and speed recovery. The aggressive diet, it eliminates all the stimulants. It, elim it eliminates all the sugar. It eliminates all the addictive foods, you know, and just the stuff that's, that's garbage, that sludges down your system, slows you down, kills your energy, kills your mood, everything else. So it's, it's aggressive, but the good thing about that in this case is by accomplishing what is not necessarily easy, it also gives you that edge. Okay, this is why exercise, um, which is not on here, or it might be off the bottom of the screen, exercise is incredibly effective at depression, at fixing depression. Why? Think about that. Because when you exercise, you feel good about yourself. You feel empowered. So exercise is routinely in the research shown to be the best thing you could possibly do for, for depression. Okay, um, then the, uh, the uh, systemic formulas, psychological trauma protocol. Um, with these protocols, if, if you guys, if, if any of you have like one of these that you want to get the information on, we just have sheets that have the protocols on there and it tells you all the supplements that are in there. We can give you the, uh, the breakdown of them, prices, all that kind of stuff. But um, we, she can print that off for you. You've got access to all those, right? The protocols? Okay. So um, so we can get those at the end of the night, just jot it down. Um, and then the last one, get adjusted, uh, pun intended, you know, get adjusted to your environment. That's what the adjustment does, is it really is all about taking the nerve system, which is the integrator. Your nerve system integrates your internal environment with the external environment, right? Think about yourself as a cell. A cell operates within, right? It's its own internal civilization that's happening and uh, in, in making itself work from the inside, but then it also has to coordinate and operate with all the cells around it called the tissue, but it also has to operate in, you know, in conjunction with the entire organ, okay, but then the organ has to operate in concert with the rest of the organs of the body to make the entire body. So that's the way it, 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 the cell has to work internally, but it also has to communicate externally. That's what cancer is, are cells that no longer operate within their environment. They're working as rogue units on their own, multiplying aggressively without care for what's happening around them.
Okay, that's the, you, you guys have heard it discussed that way. So, uh, so when you get adjusted, you're, you're building your body's ability to integrate because you're working directly with the nerve system. You're working with the integrator. Okay, make sense? Any questions on that one? Okay, it's really as simple as that. Um, if it's not as simple as that, it's because we're making it more difficult. You know, or it's because, uh, because of the permanent changes that the drugs have already done. And that's just a really hard thing to deal with. You know, if, if the drugs have already made permanent changes, then it, it's, it, it can be a real struggle. Uh, acid reflux medications. These medications are known as proton pump inhibitors. Okay, they work by cutting off gastric acid production. Okay, so what do you use to digest food? Gastric, uh, gastric acid. So your stomach produces acid to digest. These work by shutting off the valves, right? That by by cutting off gastric acid production. Okay, so we're going to go through the backwards pathway on this because I want you to see why the medical approach does it the way that they do. But I want to also show you at the same time why it's incomplete. This is the best way to show you. This is backwards planning. Okay, the military does this. If the military wants to, uh, let's say their end result is to capture Baghdad and kill Saddam Hussein. Okay. They don't start from uh, inventory ammo. They start from the end result and work backwards. Right? They, they, they'll work in stages backwards. And when you get all the way back to where you are right now, that's the starting point. Right? So the, working backwards, uh, number one, the patient feels pain from acid reflux. That's, that's what we look at. That's the end result. Okay? You feel pain from acid reflux. Number two, basic study shows pain is caused by acid. Right? Brilliant. It's like looking at the street and seeing skid marks and saying, oh, car accidents, you know, they must be caused by skid marks. I mean, it, it's, that's, that's about what conclusion you would come to here. But see, number two is where we choose to medicate. Because that's what causes it, so let's shut off acid. Problem solved. Makes sense. It makes it a lot of dollars. It doesn't make complete sense, though. You go to step three. Further study shows acid is not effectively digesting. Huh. Why would it not be effectively digesting? Should be the next question. So food not digesting because, A, how about food is indigestible? And food is in quotation marks because I kind of argue are potato chips or Twinkies really food? Right? If something is practically a plastic, does that qualify it as food? Is food something that's, uh, that's able to be integrated into the body, or is food just something that goes into your mouth? Because if food's just something that can go into your mouth, I could eat that magazine, and now it's considered food. Right? But that seems to be the way that we look at food. It's not what is supposed to be meant as fuel for our bodies, but just anything that goes into our mouth. So if the food is indigestible, then your body's not going to be able to digest it. Okay? Uh, B, gastric juices and pancreatic enzymes are insufficient. Wait a second. So the gastric juices are insufficient. Why are we turning off gastric juices? That doesn't seem to make sense. Right? But you would only come to this conclusion if you went far back enough in the science. Now you understand why people that are taking acid reflux medications long term, they create what? Gastric ulcers. Now, oh, we have a, we have a fix for that. We're going to give you a medication. I, I've, I hear this recently. I'm taking the new medication that, that, that kills the acid reflux and heals ulcers at the same time. Right? So they give you an antibiotic or whatever in the medication to kill the bacteria that's creating the ulcers from not having the juices that are killed by the medications. I mean, like, what? It's Are you serious? Huh? They're using paint to get Paul to... Exactly. It's just, well, it's, what is it about? It's about selling medications. And as long as we believe it, you know, then we're going to continue to sell medications. Um, so the gastric juices and pancreatic enzymes are insufficient. So we should probably make sure that they're sufficient. We might want to supplement with those things. Okay? Or C, organ function itself is inhibited by abnormal neurological input nerve system is not operating correctly or deficiencies nutritional deficiencies it doesn't have the things it needs to build properly and to operate properly 
uh, toxicity, you're poisoned. You know, if if uh, if you took a mouthful of mercury, do you think your stomach would operate correctly? No, you might get some heartburn from that, um, or other damage. You know, so uh, it's it's like the uh, the hot dog eating contest. Have you guys ever seen that? Yeah. You know, where the guys eat like seventy three hot dogs in a matter of five minutes, and it's like. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sure some of them complain of indigestion. I wonder why. You know, it's... The video but, of the one this year, the guy chugged X-lax or whatever, milk and magnesia, right after they gave him his old one. Yeah. Um, like the whole bottle. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it's just wrong. Mm. Wrong. So, so what you get to when you look at it this way is step five now is correct all possible causes as non-invasively as possible. <coughs> you see how backwards planning works. Okay, so this is the way we should logically <coughs> be working through health problems. I started with, uh, you know, acid reflux. I don't know if anybody here takes acid reflux medications, but this is the first one that actually applies. I mean, you can't really do this with antidepressants because we can't backwards plan depression. <coughs> you know, it's uh, that that's yeah, counseling. It would be like number two, right? <laughs> number one, you have depression. Number two, counseling. You know, it's, that's about all we can do. Uh, so did you know, in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration advised that no more than three 14-day treatment courses should be used in one year due to known risks of bone fracture indicating deteriorating effects. Do you know anybody that takes acid reflux medications that only take it for two-week periods? Yeah, this is, you can, I mean, this is the FDA's stance on it. Unreal. Unreal. They also cause food allergies because undigested proteins travel into the intestines leading to sensitization. Now, hang on a second. Why would undigested proteins get into your small intestine? Because, see, in the stomach, gastric, all, gastric juices are what break down proteins into fragments. And amino acids. So you see now you kill the acid, the proteins go straight through and now they create food allergies and sensitivities. Anybody ever heard of leaky gut syndrome? And all the you know gluten sensitivity and all these other things, you know, they're, they're, they're all part of the same complex. Okay, protocol. Alert, unless your diet and habits change while attempting this protocol, you will likely exhibit symptoms as expected. Is that expected, right? Uh, testing, no testing necessary before protocols. What can you really test? Acid levels? I mean, there's not really anything that you can test. You, your, your test is, are you digesting properly? You know, pretty much everybody knows if you are or not, okay? Uh, support, um, for support, aggressive diet protocol until a goal is achieved, at which time you could switch to the core plan. This is pretty much the same with all of them. You stay on the aggressive diet, because you're trying to cut down the inflammation as much as possible. You're trying to cut down the damage as much as possible. Then you move to the core plan once you're where you need to be. Number two, some can switch by using systemic formulas D alone. Okay, It's just a, sim a simple bottle of, it's called D for digest. And we have a lot of patients who have been able to just get off of it with just taking that alone. They usually, they, they literally just replace the acid reflux medications with the D. Why? What is in the D? Gastric juices, pancreatic enzymes. That's all it is. So we're fixing the cause, not just cutting off the symptom. Okay. Uh, number three, the pathogen purge protocol. The reason why you would do this is be, if you have a more aggressive problem, you've been on these medications for a long time. The reason why, can you see how when you take stuff in internally, your gastric juices aren't there just to produce uh, acid to break down proteins, but what else do they protect you from? Organisms, bacteria, worms, parasites. So when you don't have proper acid, you're more likely to have pathogens in your system, like worms and such, since decreased acid could allow passage. They don't get broken down properly, so now you have roundworms, tapeworms, stuff like that. So you got to do a pathogen purge to get all this stuff out. Then you move, after you've done the pathogen purge, then you go into the GI wellness protocol. This is a more aggressive approach than just doing the D alone. 
um, but you want to do after the per pathogen purge, like I said. Uh, this just reestablishes your digestion and it reestablishes your microbiome in your gut. So it gets the bacteria and everything else in there so that your microflora is actually able to self-sustain once again. Uh, I, I have all people all the time, again, that um, they're taking medications, they have digestive issues, and they just start taking probiotics. Right? I mean, that's like the big thing. Take probiotics. Take probiotics. Here's a problem, though. Who in here gardens? Okay? Uh, who in here knows somebody that gardens? All right? You know, goes. So you go to Home Depot. Here's the idea I want you to start with. Go to Home Depot and buy a bunch of plants and go and stick them in the ground. How well does that usually work? Not very well because, you know, how do I know that your ground isn't nothing but gravel? How do I know that, you know, you're, you're, trying, to, uh, you're trying to plant them in a parking lot? You know, I mean, there's all these other considerations. It's like the plant is the last step. You know, so here we're trying to just throw a bunch of bacteria into this improper terrain. The terrain is not right, so how do the bacteria replicate? The hope is with that, and you can see this is kind of like further, it's, it's not very far down the thinking of the medical approach, is we're just throwing all these poor bacteria in there to die, hoping that enough probiotics thrown in there is eventually going to populate. You know, so I guess we could go with that idea that if you go to an, if you go to Home Depot and you buy enough plants and seeds and throw them in the parking lot, something is going to come up somewhere. You know, it's going to find a crack somewhere, and it's going to take root, right? That's basically the approach when just doing probiotics. All right, so uh, number five, the chemical sensitivity protocol. Um, if food allergies exist, even after you've done the above, like you're still not able to eat certain things and uh, things still set you off, then this protocol is indicated to, to start now breaking down some of the neurological sensitivities that are occurring. Okay? This is really a pain in the butt, isn't it? I mean, looking at all these protocols, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go through all this? Yeah, you see why we shouldn't get ourselves messed up in the first place? That's, that, this is really the whole idea. This is the bottom thing I want you to see is, you know, it's so much easier when we prevent at the outright by not doing the wrong things. Uh, number six, get adjusted as often. Uh, reflux is caused simply by improper function of not just the stomach, but any part of the intestinal tract. Any part. I mean, uh, if, you, if your intestines are clogged up and they're not allowing stuff to go through, can you see how that's going to cause reflux? You ever had a clogged toilet? Right? I mean, it's the same principle. You're clogged down here, but it's causing backups up higher. Okay? So uh, if this intestinal damage or any part of the, of the digestive system is slowed down because of sub subluxation, then you're going to possibly have issues. So this has to be a component that you look at. So we're literally just looking at all those different possible issues and just clearing each one of them. Make sense? Okay. Next one, uh, pain medications. Uh, hopefully nobody in here is, is hooked on pain medications, but this is, uh, yeah, well, well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, well, I'll just go to that now. Did you know a recent report indicated Alabama has the highest rate of op opioid misuse in the nation? Highest rate. So we'll, we'll go back to that in a second. <laughs> Common categories of pain medications include, and you can see why. I mean, with, with acid reflux medications, there's really only one classification that's used. But look at all the pain medications. Opioids, NSAIDs, corticosteroids, acetaminophen, um, and others are used like muscle relaxers, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants. All of these drugs are used to get rid of, to, uh, to help patients cope with pain, right? And, and what I want you to see is that pain has been targeted as the enemy. You know, pain is, is what you need to eliminate, like cancer. It's not supposed to be there, okay? So there are various mechanisms of action all meant to do the same thing, drown out pain. So rather than go through each pathway and how the drugs work, which is really going to put you to sleep, uh, the important point is why does pain exist? Right? Why does pain exist? What's the purpose in pain? So we're going to go through the backwards pathway again. Number one, patient feels pain. Okay? We're not even going to get to step two. That's where we medicate, right? 
Like patient feels pain, that's what we attack, you know, because if you don't feel the pain, great, problem solved. Unfortunately, problem is not solved. So number two, pain is a signal regulated by the central nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord, and your nerves to indicate a problem. So when you just kill pain, it's like putting a piece of tape or a post-it note over your check engine light in your car. Or, you know, the, the, uh, an alarm is going off. You know, anybody ever, ever accidentally set off your alarm at your house? And, you know, instead of turning it off at the panel, you go and find the wire and clip it. Now it's off, you know, but it kind of defeats the purpose, right? So uh, number three, if the actual problem is not resolved, it does what? It gets worse because you're not listening to the signal that's telling you that there's a problem. Okay, number four, find the source of the problem and correct it again as non-invasively as possible. Whatever route you can, you can fix that problem without causing other problems. That's the best way to do it. Okay. So, again, did you know a recent report indicated Alabama has the highest rate of opioid misuse in the nation? So, this indicates both a blind ignorance on behalf of the users and the doctors. Because the doctors can't be immune from this. This means that we're over-prescribing. These are now street drugs. I mean, this is what... Forget the, I mean, think about this. Forget the legal, the illegal stuff. If you were an intelligent drug dealer nowadays, you wouldn't even touch the illegal stuff. There are so many legal medications that you could, you know, that the penalty is so much less for, right? And you know? Or a hot item. Right. I sale. mean, it's, and people, people are more likely to take them because they don't hold the stigma that the illegal stuff does. Right. So, you know, it's like, why, why would you even mess with the, the illegal stuff when there's all this other stuff that you can gain access to? And, I mean, it's just crazy. So um, when medications are used to treat pain, not only do they not address the cause, but they cause liver damage, kidney damage, gastrointestinal damage, stomach damage, uh, intestinal bleeding, all these other problems which now create a bigger problem that your body has to address, your body has to fix, which is taking attention away from the pr first problem you were trying to fix in the first place. Your body can't heal itself because now it's healing your liver instead. This is why I have such a problem with pain medications. I'm, I'm like, you know, look, the pain is going to keep you from hurting yourself worse. But doctor, you know, what can I do about the pain until, you know, it's, I don't know. But don't take pain medications. Because it just makes the problem worse. You've got to get to the cause. Okay. Uh, protocol. Alert. Most pain medications are only meant to be used for a very short period of time. Uh, yet, I routinely find patients have been on them for years. And when I say routinely, I mean almost daily. At least weekly. I mean, I have new patients come in and I find out that they've been taking Lortab for six years. Lortab is meant to be taken for no more than six weeks, not six years. That was my, my uh, oldest sister as a pharmacist, and that's the first ever medication advice she ever told me for patients. Make absolutely sure your patients do not take Lortab for more than six weeks because we know it causes liver damage. That's why they check liver enzymes all the time. <laughs> so... Uh, the problem is, as we'll see here in a second, I'll, I'll move forward to that, irreparable organ damage has likely occurred, already occurred, and should not be taken lightly. So it's likely already occurred. Not going to, it already has. The testing, rational diagnosis, should be used to uncover the cause of the pain. Right? Rational diagnosis. Which means sometimes you have to actually put your hands on patients, not just talk to them for two minutes. You know, you actually have to... Uh, feel around and see what's going on, see what, where the pain is. Uh, if pain meds have been used long term, even liver enzyme blood work is inconclusive because it only shows you when the liver is already in failure. You're not going to have high liver enzymes until your liver is already failing. Make sense? So it's a, it's a ridiculous test to look at because you're, you're waiting until, until the patient already has a bullet in their head to see if, they've, you know, to see if the gun is loaded. I mean, it's just, it's, it's such a weird scenario, but this is how so many of the, the tests work. Um, 
Number one, support. Aggress a diet protocol to cut systemic inflammation and promote optimal healing efficiency. Okay, so cut inflammation because inflammation causes pain and you want to speed the body's recovery. So eliminate sugar. Make sense? Okay. Number two, high dose omega fatty acids have ample research for their effectiveness at reducing pain and mitigating inflammation while promoting cellular repair. So it repairs cells and it cuts inflammation. That's why that's going to be good for pain. Three, for quick response to pain, use something natural. If you've got to use something, use something natural. Salazine, Zymane, Proenz, use one of these natural components to cut the pain, not Tylenol, Excedrin, Advil, Aleve, all these other things. Okay? Uh, number four, most importantly, find the cause of pain and correct it. Find the cause of pain. Do whatever you have to do to find the cause of the pain. Number five, systemic formula cellular inflammation protocol to help with the long-term damage caused by the use of medications. So now you're not just getting rid of the medications, but you're using things to repair your body from the damage the medications did. And yet, we buy Tylenol over the counter and give it to our kids. I mean, think about this. It's, Tylenol is a leading cause of acute liver failure in the United States. You can't, I harp on this one a lot, just because it's, it's such an easy target. You know, marijuana is illegal in the United States, yet, I mean, I don't know anybody that's died from it. I don't really know anybody that's, you know, smoked themselves to death or anything like that. And, uh, and it's an easy target for me because I've never done it before. Uh, I just think it's absolutely ridiculous that it's illegal when you can buy Tylenol for your kids. It's not that I'm necessarily against it being illegal. It's just, come on, let's get some rationale here. It's like you're going to make this illegal and, tell, and arrest people and throw them in prison for it, yet this person's feeding their kid Tylenol, damaging their liver, and it's okay. It's like where are we, you know, we're, we're picking and choosing at this point, and we got to argue, we got to contend. Why are we picking and choosing? How are we choosing our battles? You know, there, there's, there's obviously something behind it. So uh, thyroid medications. Uh, this is one of the tougher ones. This is one of the bigger categories. And uh, the scary part, if you guys have not watched the deficiency workshop and the deficiency is fulfilled workshops, go back and watch those on YouTube because um, you will see really quickly why they say one in three Americans now have thyroid conditions whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed. One in three. Don't tell me that's genetic. Right? There is something going on, and we, I go through all that, why that's occurring. So there are three major categories of thyroid dysfunction to address, HTH, HT, and SOL. Okay? When your massively important thyroid gland has been surgically removed or destroyed with radioactive iodine, there is not much option other than using Synthroid or Armor Thyroid to, re, to replace. So... I'm, I'm being a little jokingly there. You can see where SOL I get that from. I'm not, I'm not being not being harsh on that, but literally this is this is what we've got to get to. Look, when you when you surgically cut your arm off, you're SOL. There's no getting that arm back, right? You're not going to grow a new one. So when we allow doctors to cut organs out of our bodies as a first option instead of a last resort, we're SOL. Make sense? Um, but this is standard protocol still. I mean, surgically removing and destroying it by taking, by giving radioactive iodine. Think about that for a second. The treatment is radioactive iodine. What does that imply? That the thyroid gland is quickly and rapidly absorbing the iodine. Right? So, don't you think there's something to that? We got to look at. We got to investigate. It's unbelievable. Hyperthyroid is characterized by an overactive and under-coordinated immune system. Common causes are intestinal dysbiosis. Does everybody know what that is? Intestinal dysbiosis is is your gut not working in homeostasis. When your intestinal flora and 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 everything we were talking about when it's not working correctly. When your intestinal flora is, is basically when your garden won't grow vegetables. Make sense? It's when your dirt is so awful that nothing can grow there. The terrain is messed up. So uh, intestinal dysbiosis is a common cause. Uh, allergies, which are neurological. Allergies are, are, are always a neurological event. It's an oversensitivity response. 
Um, nutrition, if you've got nutritional deficiencies, that's going to complicate things. Vitamin D deficiency is hugely implicated. A lot of people start with thyroid issues because their vitamin D is tanked, which by the way, again, in the deficiency workshop, that tested anybody and found that their vitamin D levels are normal. It just doesn't happen. You know, everybody is tanked. Um, heavy metal exposure. Uh, this is our heavy metal toxicity is a big one and chemical exposure. All these things, they're, they're the primary agents at causing hyperthyroid, so they overexcite your system. But here's a proposal that I want to uh, point out to you that, you know, uh, where, where medical doctors and homeopaths are different on this topic. See, a medical doctor will look at your thyroid and see that it's hyper and see that as the problem. Okay? But stop and think about it for a second. Might we consider for a minute that it is the solution? So in other words, your body and its innate intelligence is speeding up the function of your thyroid gland for a reason. It's trying to do something. And it's doing whatever it can to, it will, it will be willing to sacrifice components of the overall system in order to save you as a whole. Make sense? So your body will sacrifice organs and tissues if it means keeping the, or, the entire individual alive. This is known. This is a principle in science that you know, we, has known to be true for, for centuries. So we need to look at this a little bit different. It's not necessarily a problem. It's in a lot of cases, it's the solution to it. Um, hypothyroid, on the other hand, is characterized by underproduction of thyroid hormones. So it's not overworking. It's underworking. Okay, many of the reasons for this are exactly the same as above. They're the, exactly the same problems. But for some reason, in different individuals, they affect different stages of the thyroid hormone pathway. Hence, they have cl different clinical manifestations. So the way that the cascade of the hormones work, different people are affected at different levels. And so it takes a completely different path of the way that it manifests uh, based on how the pituitary is working and how it's sending thyroid uh, stimulating hormone and how the thyroid gland itself is responding to that and breaking T4 down into the active form T3. You know, depending on where that system is broken apart, depends on how it's going to manifest. Okay? So, simple nutritional precursor deficiencies such as selenium and iodine are also common causes. Simply put, we know that the thyroid uses iodine to produce iodine or to produce thyroid hormones. Okay? So, if you're deficient in iodine, can you see how you're going to have an under-effective thyroid gland? Which, this, is a, this is a big one. Huh? Which is why we iodize our salt, because there was a massive deficiency in, what, the 40s? Mm -hmm. Nationwide, um, and they figured out, oh, it's because people don't have enough iodine in their diet, but there's still not yeah. enough iodine in our salt. Yeah. That, that, well, that, that's the funny thing. Uh, when you go back and you, if you watch the deficiency workshop, I go through all of that stuff in there. And, uh, and cover the fact that iodine <coughs> used to be in all the bread products. They removed it and they replaced it with bromine, which is an iodine inhibitor. And the only place that it's left is in salt. But salt, it actually readily uh, evaporates off the top of the salt. So by the time you actually use the salt, it's already gone. So we're tanked in iodine. Pretty much nobody is getting it unless you're eating wild caught uh, wild caught seafood in abundance or um, grass fed animals like grass fed beef in abundance. Those are the only two sources that we really get it from. Um, grass fed milk products, they can have it too. But, but go watch that workshop because you'll be blown away. You'll see you have to change your entire diet because the core staples of American diets are completely deprived. They, you're, you're not getting it anywhere. So you end up deficient. Um, okay, so the protocol for hyper alert hormone levels must be monitored closely when changing medication. I can't stress this one enough. Uh, this should only be attempted if you thoroughly understand your response to changes in your levels. Medical supervision is recommended. Uh, I do have to say that, you know, if you don't know how your body responds to ups and downs of thyroid uh, hormones, you can really harm yourself pretty quickly. I mean, you can suffer heart damage and, and things like that. So you got to know your body and pay attention to it. Really understand what you're going through and, and take it slowly. So testing. Pre-test thyroid hormone levels as a back check. 
testing your hormone levels is really not a, it, it should not be the primary measure for treatment of thyroid issues because all it's doing is kind of like the liver enzymes. It's only testing what's seen after the fact. It's not really looking at the problem itself. You're looking at, I mean, all the time, people go in and they get tested for their thyroid and their, and their, you know, their thyroid tests come back perfectly fine even though they're exhibiting every sign of hypothyroid. And it's simply because they barely have enough say iodine to produce enough thyroid hormone to show up as normal on the test. The rest of their body is completely starving and it's working overtime to try and keep up. But you're never going to see it because all you see is that after the, after the fact test. So you can't really look at that. It's just a back check to see that everything is working properly once you're, once you're done and working again. Uh, get your vitamin D tested and you have to get it up to 60 to 100 if it's low. It has to be that high. Your, body, your hormone, your thyroid will not work if it's not working uh, if your vitamin D level is a 15. It's just not going to work right. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, Meta-oxy urine test. Oh, I know what you were pointing at. You were pointing at that's not lined up properly. <laughs> you're Danielle's dad. Right? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the meta-oxy urine test, um, what that looks at is that looks at the aldehyde damage. So it looks like it looks when you're having free radical damage done in your body, uh, you produce aldehydes in your urine. So you know that you've got massive chemical exposure and toxicity issues if your metoxy test is showing up as a high rate. And this is a super, super cheap, inexpensive test that, that we do here. If you guys haven't done, had it done, we can do that here. Um, and then uh, food sensitivity testing may be advised if suspected. May be advised, but you know you deal with the, all the other stuff first. So support. Number one, you see no rhythm here? Aggressive diet plan to reduce systemic inflammation. Eat ample amounts of broccoli, cabbage, and kale as they contain goitrogens which slow down your thyroid. So these foods actually naturally inhibit the thyroid from, uh, from producing excess amounts of hormones. So if you're high then should you not eat? You should, you should limit your ingestion of those things. But I don't even list it on the thing because, you know, that, that's kind of a lesser factor. Uh, you know, I think the nutritional load for hypo is more important because that's not the, pr the primary cause of it is not because you're eating too much broccoli. You know, I don't think anybody's hypo because of that, right? So, uh, so I don't even list that on the other pages you'll see. Um, number two, may also avoid wheat, barley, rye, oats, kamut, spelt. All of those are gluten products. Okay, so you want to avoid gluten uh, possibly. You may want to if the first category isn't enough, simply because of the intestinal issues that it can cause and the back, you know, the back issues that it, that it creates. Um, also, eggplant, tomatoes, and onions are part of the uh, nightshade vegetables. So they're shown to have some uh, inhibiting effects or, or uh, sorry, excitation effects of the thyroid. And then caffeine also. Caffeine raises your barometer, you know, your thermometer in your body, and that's what the thyroid is. So you don't want to overexcite it even more. So you limit caffeine. Uh, start core supplements to repair basic functions and reduce inflammation. Okay. Um, Number four, systemic formulas GI wellness protocol to repair gut permeability and dysbiosis. Okay, you want to get your terrain working again because that's where a lot of this problem starts. Five, systemic formula cellular inflammation protocol to repair cellular and immune system function and then follow that up with the IDS system which is the, uh, the intracellular detox system. You would want to do that for three to six months to continue to purge out those toxins that are stored up in your cells, creating this issue. And then number six, get adjusted. <laughs> get that thing, make sure that from a neurological standpoint, it's not just being neurologically overstimulated, because that is a possibility. Okay, so this is the basic protocol for hyper, okay, hypo. Uh, with um, hormone levels must be monitored closely, same, same disclaimer exactly. Uh, testing, pre-test thyroid hormone levels as a back check, get vitamin D tested and up to 60 to 100 at flow. Here's a different one, the iodine patch test. You want to do an iodine patch test because unlike hyper, if you're hyper, you've, 
you've likely got enough iodine because how would it be producing too many hormones if you don't have the supplies to build the hormones? Make sense? So uh, you don't want to throw in more iodine if you're hyper because you can actually overexcite the problem. You can, you can give your body more fuel for the fire. Uh, but in this one, it's a different, it's a different situation. Um, the meta-oxyurine test. Uh, again, in the food allergy testing, may be advised as suspected. So, number one, uh, aggressive diet plan to reduce systemic inflammation, same exact thing. Number two, core supplements uh, to repair basic functions and reduce inflammation. Number three, eliminate fluoride. You have to completely eliminate fluoride exposure in toothpaste and anywhere else that you can possibly eliminate it from. Non-stick cookware, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you're drinking uh, water out of the tap, you're getting fluoride. And here's why. As little as 2 milligrams per day can cripple your thyroid function in the studies, in the research. 2 milligrams a day can cripple thyroid function. That's an incredibly small amount. That's been proven in the research. I guarantee you, you're getting that much if you're drinking tap water. And isn't it ironic that where two milligrams is all is necessary to cripple people's thyroids, we're putting it in the tap water. And one in three people have a thyroid problem. And one in three people have a thyroid problem. Isn't that just incredible? Right? So, um, you've got to get rid of fluoride. Fluoride is also a main ingredient. This just stunned me. I did not know this until I was researching for this workshop. Fluoride is a main ingredient, one of the primary ingredients in SSRI antidepressant medications. So why would they do that? Because we know that fluoride calcifies the pineal gland in the brain. It calcifies it. It turns it into a rock in the center of your brain. And so, you know, when you use fluoride, it stunts thinking. This is, uh, if, if, you, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, like the dirty stuff with this, um, you look, look to the conspiracy theories about fluoride. And, and they, they know, I mean, people have documented, and they, they've said that fluoride would be an effective measure for population control. You know, in other words, mass, mass um, psychological control because it dumbs down your ability to think and differentiate. It basically works as an antidepressant. So of course, when you understand that, you would see why it's a main ingredient. Number four, progesterone is a, oh, and by the way, on the toothpaste, this is pretty cool, just a side note, um, a patient introduced me to a toothpaste, and, you know, I didn't know if it was going to be any good. She, she asked me, you know, if I had heard about it, and usually when I'm brought products, you know, they usually have something junk in them, but I found out it was totally clean, and I started doing research on it. Um, it's called Theodent, and, uh, and it's a researcher that found a, a natural component in chocolate that, that helps your body to produce hydroxyapatite, which is enamel on teeth. And so when you brush your teeth with it, it lays down sheets of new material on top of your teeth. And uh, so it whitens and repairs and, and reduces sensitivity as it, as it literally rebuilds your teeth. And it works really quickly. I didn't really believe it at first, but I started, uh, I, I got a tube of it from her. She, she brought me a tube for it, of it to try out. And I started using it and I had some, some little brown spots on my teeth um, from when I was a kid. I ate tremendous amounts of sugar, I, you know, unregulated amounts of sugar. And so I destroyed my teeth at a young age. And while I've been able to maintain them over the last, you know, 13 years, and they haven't gotten worse, they really haven't gotten any better, but after using it for just like two weeks, the spots are already disappearing. Right? And so I'm like, hallelujah, that's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so on that note, we did just order a bunch and we're, we're going to be having it here in the office because it's a true alternative to fluoride to where it gives you absolutely no reason from a dental perspective, no dentist has the option, you know, has the, the justification anymore to tell you there's no better option, you've got to do fluoride, because there is a better option now. So, pretty cool. Um, I don't believe all the fluoride's, you know, garbage anyways about teeth. Uh, number four, progesterone is a precursor from T4 to T3, so you're, it turns the inactive 
thyroid hormone into the active form. So birth control drugs can actually stunt this conversion if you don't have proper amounts of progesterone. So how many women experience thyroid hormones and uh, th thyroid issues and hormonal insufficiency at the same time? <laughs> Do you see why? You know, because they, they go hand in hand. They're in the same process. Okay, selenium is another precursor from T4 to T3. Uh, and I want to talk about this one for just a second because people will tell you if you get on the internet and you start searching and looking up about iodine, you'll find tons of people that talk about iodine saying do not give, even doctors, saying do not give iodine to patients with hypothyroid and Hashimoto's because it's like throwing fuel on the fire. And what they're, what they're coming down to is what they don't realize is it's actually a, a coupled selenium deficiency that's not allowing the iodine to be used and, and converted properly. So the patient's body just starts rapidly making more and more T3, trying to push T4, but it can't because you're deficient in selenium. So you fix the selenium problem first, and then you add in the iodine, and it works just fine. Remarkable, huh? That stinking biochemistry, right? It's amazing what we can do with science. Therefore, systemic formulas, mores, uh, should be taken for 30 days before proceeding to the hypothyroid protocol. So you take that for 30 days, build it for selenium levels, get your cells working a little better, and then you can add in the TMI and it, and it will accept a lot better. The TMI, by the way, has selenium in with it. Also, the iodine synergy that we switch people to after they've been doing the TMI for a sufficient period of time, that also has selenium in it. So you never want to take just straight iodine without selenium with it. Make sense? Okay. So uh, last one, systemic formula, thyroid protocol, followed by the intracellular detox system. And then I'm sure down here at the bottom under the screen is what? Get adjusted. Get adjusted. Exactly. Get it working. Make sure that it's got the electricity turned on. Okay. So does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Now, um, next one, cholesterol medications. Cholesterol medications or statins are now one of the most prescribed medications in the U.S. They work by shutting down an enzyme in the liver where cholesterol is produced. So, yes, it's actually produced in the body. You do not get high cholesterol from eating cholesterol. Yeah, how many doctors tell you don't eat eggs, don't eat this, don't eat that because you have high cholesterol and you don't want to raise it? It's ridiculous. You do not raise cholesterol by eating cholesterol. It is impossible. So uh, you produce cholesterol as a healthy and very necessary response. So in other words, once again, it's the body trying to fix itself, not the problem itself, uh, to poor dietary choices. So uh, cholesterol is a spackle in the body. It goes back and it repairs arterial damage in your body. So if you're doing all kinds of damage to your body by proteins that leak through your intestinal wall, and get into your bloodstream called leaky gut syndrome. You guys seeing the connections here? This is fascinating, isn't it? Okay, you get, you get leaky gut syndrome because of indigested proteins leaking through your intestinal walls, get into your bloodstream, scar up your arteries, your body raises cholesterol to repair that damage. So what do we need to fix? You guys are getting good at this. Your Intestinal dysbiosis. Exactly, we fix the digestive system. So, uh, did you know, research shows statins. How many people are taking statins? You don't have to raise your hand in here, but how many people? Millions, millions. It's the number one prescribed drug in the United States category. Research shows statins do not decrease mortality risk in women of any age. What, why do people take these medications? Because they don't want to die of a stroke or a heart attack. But the research shows it doesn't reduce your risk of dying from a stroke or a heart attack. So what are you really taking it for? To lower a number on a piece of paper. You're taking a drug every day to lower a number on a piece of paper that means absolutely nothing to you at the end of the day. Shockingly sad. It increases your risk of diabetes by 48%. The funny thing is, usually the drug companies, their number one selling drug is what? A cholesterol medication. What's their number two selling drug? A diabetic medication. Wow, that's convenient, isn't it? 
Yet millions of women take them for fear of death. For men, 99 out of 100 receive no benefit either. It does nothing to reduce your risk of a first heart attack. It only shows benefit possibly if you've already had one heart attack and it's going to reduce the risk of having another heart attack. And usually if you're over the age of 50. That's the other condition it has to fit. So this is, uh, this is according to Dr. Mark Hyman. He's one of the, mo one of the leading authorities out there. I think he's a professor at U uh, UCLA. Uh, he's a doctor, and, um, and he's a medical doctor. And he's, you know, he raves about this stuff, that the science is completely misleading on this, and we need to can it all together because it's worthless. Um, alert. These drugs are causing side effects such as muscle pain, diabetes, and liver damage, while studies are routinely skewed to maintain profits. Therefore, the alert would be staying on them longer. <laughs> testing. None needed as cholesterol testing is only assessing a secondary measure of the underlying problem. How do you fix it? Aggressive diet plan to reduce arterial wall damage and intestinal permeation. You're fixing the gut. You're getting rid of the inflammation. Number two, if you really want to see that number come down for your sake of mind, you can use a product like Forresterol, which we have up front, which may be used to reduce minor non-medicated increases. Okay, if you're not taking medication and it's high, your doctor is trying to press you to get on the medications to get it low and you just want to stop the doctor from, from getting on you about it, you can take forestrol and lower it down. There's some other things you can use too, red rice yeast extract and stuff like that. Um, but they don't really, again, they don't fix the problem. Okay? For those taking medications for chronic problems, systemic formulas, comprehensive heart cardio support protocol first followed by the GI wellness protocol. So you're, you're, you're giving the heart what it needs just to keep functioning well and build the, uh, the, the cardiovascular, the arterial and venous system. You're getting those healthy. Then you fix the GI wellness. You get, you get your gut system working again. Then you do the cellular information protocol to get rid of all the inflammation that was caused You know, once you've gotten the other problems cleared out. And you do all this with two to four week breaks in between. So all that to fix a simple problem that's a reaction to poor diet. If a pendulous abdomen is present, which often goes with high cholesterol, why is that? Go back to the Big Fat Lie workshop. Watch that workshop. That, that was the last one, right? Big Fat Lie? No? What was the last workshop? Yeah. Lifestyle. Oh, lifestyle. Very good. Okay, so it was the second to last one. Um, the, the, the Big Fat Lie workshop goes on about uh, where the pendulous abdomen comes from and, and what the real issue is underneath there. So go back and watch that workshop. Uh, purchase a home colonic irrigation kit. Doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> Shouldn't have gotten the gut in the first place. Uh, should be considered as problem may persist until dramatically reduced. And I say dramatically because I've had patients do home colonics and lose 23 pounds in a week from just garbage coming out of their insides. Literally, it's like black tar. It's like rubber that pulls out in strings out of their intestines. <laughs> yeah, so it's called a mucoid plaque. Lovely thing. Okay. Hypertension. Hypertension is one of the most ridiculously mistreated conditions today, resulting in billions of dollars in both pharmaceutical and physician costs. Drugs include diuretics, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and angiotensin antagonists. So, do you see a trend here? All these things, all these drugs are set up, are meant to block processes that naturally occur in the body. Okay? So the question never arises with us, why are they occurring in the body? Right? Why are they happening in the first place? There's got to be a reason. The body is not dumb. Okay? It's doing it for a reason. So once again, though, we need to look at each pathway. We need not look at each pathway as they don't address the cause, which is inflammation. So here's how it works. Simple diagram. You think we could teach this in medical school, right? So... This is normal blood flow, this nice open channel that you can pump oxygen and nutrients through readily, right? It goes through there, no problem. Nice big opening in the middle. But now you eat a diet full of sugar and garbage, 
and it damages and scars up and causes inflammation in the arterial system. So that nice big large opening closes down further and further and further until it's little tiny. So because you're having to pump through oxygen and nutrients to your brain to keep you functioning and alive, what's the only logical step that your body can take to raise the blood pressure? Sorry, I just answered that question. <laughs> so you raise the blood pressure. I mean, it's, it's so obvious that I couldn't contain the answer, right? I mean, you raise the blood pressure because you're pushing it through faster, right? You know, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, w would you like it if you stood at the gas tank and you're, you're, I mean, have you ever done that? You go into a gas station and you and you turn on the, the pump on full and it's like trickling through. Yeah. You know, that only, it only happens once in a while, but when it's, I'm like, somebody, please turn up the pressure on this thing. I usually just hang it up and I leave. Like, I'm not gonna use your stinking pump, right? <laughs> so, you know, you raise a blood pressure to fix the problem that you're seeing occur. That's what your body does. So now we, in all of our genius, we go in there and we shut down the blood pressure. We use blocks, chemical blocks, to shut that process down. What are you really doing? Keeping the oxygen and the nutrients from your body. Bingo. So your brain starves to death. Now, what happens, <laughs> what, what disease do you set yourself up with when you starve cells of oxygen and nutrients? Cancer. Cancer. So here's the reality. The alert, when you are taking blood pressure medications, you not only fail to address the problem, you trade one risk, heart disease, for cancer instead. This is unbelievable. It's unacceptable, yet we're still doing this every day. And most often, you know what the answer is? The answer that doctors give is, well, we you know, we, we know that the patient's not going to change, so we just have to give them the answer that's going to be easy for them. That's garbage. You know what? Let's be responsible. How about that, doctors? Let, let's be responsible for our patients because, after all, I, I, if I remember correctly, we're the ones with the education, right? You're, you know, the patients are coming to us to help solve the problems, not give you the easy answer. Yeah, you know, we're we're just throwing billions of these drugs out, and you know, and every day I have to I have to take new patients in who are taking these medications, and I have to be the one to try and get them off the drugs. When that's not even within my scope of practice, but who else is going to do it? You know, all I can do is give you the. I can't tell you to get off the medications, but I can certainly give you the information. Last time I learned, doctor meant teacher, so by all means, I'm going to teach. Testing, monitor blood pressure closely if you choose to reduce medication and do it slowly. The reason why your brain must have time to respond accordingly and regulate as the chemical interference is removed. So think about this for a second. If your brain is trying to raise your blood pressure, have you ever heard anybody say, you know, my doctor just had to raise my blood pressure medications again? It constantly happens. Why? Or they switch the medications to a different category. The reason why is because your body will find a way to give oxygen and nutrition to your brain. So it will continue to produce more and more and more and more and more, trying to push up your blood pressure to where it needs to be, and, and you constantly have to fight it to try and bring it down and down and down and down and down. Okay? So if you go and you remove those chemical blocks all at the same time, what happens? Your brain, it's spewing out these chemicals, telling the blood pressure to raise, your blood pressure shoots through the roof and you stroke out, you blow a blood vessel, right? So you've got to do this process slowly. Um, okay, so support. Aggressive diet plan, imagine this, to reduce systemic inflammation. You've got to get rid of the inflammation in there. That's what's causing the problem. Uh, number two, core supplements to support healthy function of your cardiovascular system as well as every other system in your body and fill the basic deficiencies. Number three, systemic formulas heart energy protocol to restore ATP energy. So your heart, if it's been pushing out all this, you know, trying to raise the blood pressure and just pushing, 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 can you see how it's going to be fatigued? Okay, this is how people have heart attacks because their, their, their heart has been just working so hard to try and get the blood pressure up to where it needs to be. Finally, it just gives out. So the, the heart is often starved of ATP, which is... 
the energy molecule in your body. That's what your body, what your cells live off of. So this protocol just restores that ATP energy so that it has what it needs to now go through this transition properly. Uh, then start with light exercise and increase over time. You've got to start lightly, and, but get out there, start exercising. You've got to, and we take their blood pressure. We find out, yes, indeed it is high. We adjust them, let them stand on the vibe for 10 minutes, and then check their blood pressure again, and it's dropped 20 points. Tell me a blood pressure medication that can do that, right? So it's remarkable how well it works, but see, it's just because you're getting your body to a neurological reset. You're just letting it, it cope better and more efficiently. But that adjustment isn't instantly curing the inflammation that caused the problem in the first place, right? So what happens? It creeps back up, okay? Again, if you're overweight or have a pendulous abdomen, home colonic irrigation followed by the gut dysbiosis protocol is recommended if not required. You know, if you have a large, a large pendulous abdomen, you're going to have to do those steps. It's just, it's just part of the picture. So, uh, last one, <laughs> diabetic medications. Diabetic medications are like blood pressure and cholesterol drugs, a secondary attempt to clear markers and symptoms of the unaddressed cause. They do not affect the cause. The end result is loss of limbs and death. I was talking with a patient earlier about this today, you know, that, that it's like, you know, you, you may like Mountain Dew, but are you willing to trade your limbs for that Mountain Dew? Because that's what you're walking towards. And that's just reality. You know, we got, we got, we've got to face the facts. Due to the nature of diabetes, you must address multiple components of the condition simultaneously, or you will have little or no effect on the condition itself. Those components are threefold. It's like a ripple in the water. You've got to contain it from all sides. Number one is sugar intake. It's diet. It's what you're putting in. You've got to cut the sugar intake because that's the problem with diabetes. It has nowhere to go. The cells are full. They're not accepting sugar anymore. So when you put it in your system, the, the sugar starts building up in your cardio system and it can shut down and do damage to your heart. So what do they do? They give you insulin to push more sugar into your cells. It just opens up more and more channels to push more and more sugar in. And the more insulin you use, the more insulin resistant your cells become to where you can't push any more sugar in and you, you die, you lose limbs. Okay? So number two, sugar storage. The, the cells are full. They're not burning any energy. They're not burning the sugar that's there. You've got to get them starved of sugar so that now they can accept sugar from where? The arterial system, the blood system where it's building up and causing the diabetic symptoms. Okay, so this is metabolic function. And then energy output, you've got to actually burn the, the, the sugar that's already inside the cells. You've got to get it out. And that's, that's where exercise comes into play. You get the cells burning again. Okay? So alert blood sugar that is out of control can result in disability and death. Changes should be very closely monitored and respected to avoid serious complications. You know, if you just cold turkey blank, I'm not going to do insulin anymore, I'm going to get off all my drugs, I mean, there's a, I, there's a chance you're going you're gonna to fall over and you're going to, that's where you're going to be. You know, you're not going to get up again because you can't let your blood sugar just crash. So you've got to go smart about this one. A simple blood sugar monitor available at any drugstore can be used to monitor trends in blood sugar and you just work this, pro, this protocol slowly. Um, you do all the steps, but over time, it will start to regulate and clear. We've had, you know, with some of these, you may only have to do one of them. I've had, I've had a patient, uh, I've got a lady who, uh, she had a, um, a glucose uh, or an insulin pump on her side that she had had for 15 years. Okay? You think that's never going to recover, right? She got adjusted and, uh, and it took her a couple times getting adjusted to figure it out what was happening because it just crashed and I, I, this isn't the only case. I mean, I know other, other uh, colleagues who have had the same thing happen, like patients passing out in their cars and stuff like that because they had insulin monitors or insulin pumps on. Well, she, uh, she ended up having to take it, like, like regulate it and, and take it off or shut it off or whatever after her adjustments because her insulin automatically starts working again. She got adjusted and after 15 years on an insulin pump, all of a sudden it started working and it was fine for like a day.
So, you know, and then, and then things start going haywire again. So obviously the organ's still working. It's just not working on a regular basis. It's stunted because of the insulin pump, okay? Um, aggressive diet plan to promote sugar starvation. You cannot have sugar on the advanced diet plan because you've got to get to sugar starvation and you've got to cut the inflammation, okay? If you don't have that plan, get it. The light exercise that, that increases over time to increase stored sugar utilization and promote the switch to fat burning for energy. You've got to switch to fat burning, not sugar burning. Um, that's, that's where all the toxins are to get those out of the cells. Uh, three, core supplements to fulfill deficiencies and improve cellular function. Um, consider any meds you take that increase risk of diabetes, such as statins. If you're taking cholesterol medications, why don't you get rid of that first before you can attempt the, the diabetic medications? Make sense? Okay. Systemic formulas, glucose, metabolic dysregulation protocol, at, uh, either before or after the systemic detox protocol. You can do one or the other um, first. There's not really, some doctors use it before, some doctors do it afterwards. It works both ways. But you want to really do both of those, the systemic detox and the glucose regulation. Um, and then last one, get adjusted to improve overall metabolic capacity and your body's ability to utilize the sugar and control pancreatic function the way that it's supposed to. Okay, so do you see a theme across all of these? What, what's, the, what's, what's the big, uh, the overriding theme that you guys picked up on? Inflammation. Inflammation, very good. Diet. 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 Exercise. Exercise. Get adjusted. Get adjusted. Okay, did you see that basically every single one of these common problems that people are on lifestyle drugs for, they're all the same problem. That's what you should come to the conclusion of. They're all the same problem. All the diseases that we have that manifest in different ways, they're all the same thing. Inflammation caused by what? <laughs> Sugar. Uh, caused by lifestyle. I mean, sugar is a major component of it, but it's caused by our lifestyle. So in other words, who is killing us? We are. It's, we are lifestyling ourselves to death. And uh, it makes it really easy when it's promoted by society. It makes it really easy when the government uh, mandates or subsidizes it. You know, it makes it really easy when every vendor out.